So anyone who's familiar with my writing or, uh, on drugs will know that the question that concerns me is the extent to which psychedelic experience is trans-historical, trans-cultural. To what extent do we leap out of our cultural bounds? And uh, if you read the, uh, the paper I've got in the Breaking Convention book, I really reached the conclusion, is it even possible to address this question? However, irrespective of how you choose to answer it, you can't ignore the importance of culture. Culture has a, a major influence on the psychedelic experience. We know it's set and setting. This is not news. And uh, when I was uh, invited to speak about, say something about British psychedelia, it occurred to me, why do we need the qualification? Why do we need British psychedelia? Is there something uh, distinctive about it? But also the fact that we need that qualification, it seems to imply that psychedelia was really something that happened somewhere else uh, across the pond. Is there an American hegemony on psychedelia? Dennis Hopper there from Easy Rider. And if you look at the history of psychedelia, by which I mean psychedelic culture, art, music, writing, literature, so on and so forth, film, it always tends to get simplified. This was one of the great motivations to me to write Shroom nearly 10 years ago, that I was reading the same stories over and over again. I felt I was reading mythology and I wanted history. Mythology necessarily simplifies stories. This is what we do as humans. You know, if you had a, a legendary weekend and you tell your friends, you immediately reduce it to a juicy story, you tell all the good bits. And pick up almost any book out there in the bookstalls and you'll read about the same people. And it is usually the great men. I've left a few off, I haven't mentioned Lloyd Huxley. Albert Hoffman, Gordon Wasson, Tim Leary, Ralph Metzner, Terence McKenna, Alan Watts, and maybe Dan Pinchbeck gets put in there. They usually, I mean, I know Albert Hoffman is Swiss and Aldous Huxley was British, but they're mostly American. So there is this feeling that it happened somewhere else. Originally, what I was going to do, I was going to choose 10 key moments from British psychedelia that I thought illustrated something about the nature of British psychedelia. And then I realised I only had half an hour and there was no way I was going to fit it all into half an hour. I'm just going to look at three people, the influence of three people. It may be a surprising choice. Uh, at the risk of creating my own simplification, my own mythologising. And I want you to remember that whatever I say, the story is always more complicated. And I'm going to look at the influence of three men, telling in itself. So my first uh, great man of British psychedelia is the poet Robert Graves. There he is looking incredibly dapper, uh, yeah, a man of style. As you know, I'm sure you know this, he was a poet, an essayist, a novelist. He was also an establishment figure, he was Oxford Professor of Poetry, not uncontroversially, but you don't get that job unless you're something of an establishment figure, and yet at the same time he was something of a bohemian. He spent much of his life living in New Yorker, in Dale, and he created, if you like, or felt he had discovered uh, an ancient religion, an ancient theme in archaic religion, in uh, the religion of Greece and Rome, and maybe of the Celts too. And he made this his personal religion, his personal quest. His quest was for the muse, the white goddess. She was a rather cruel, domineering, scary goddess, the goddess who granted or denied poetic inspiration. And he sought the white goddess throughout his creative life. As I also understand it, he vigorously pursued the, mood, the muse in human form as well whenever she appeared uh, at his uh, uh, pad down in Mallorca in Dale. Uh, various uh, hippies went and visited him 
uh, in Mallorca, not least David Allen from the uh, great psychedelic band Gone. David Allen, whilst staying with Graves, had the acid trip that uh, produced the uh, flying teapot mythology. If you know that of Gone, then shame on you. I'm just assuming that you're all major Gone fans. Gone completely uh, exploded into my life when I was 16. And Johnny Mathis and Liz Orton, you can always tell it was at school, um, if you remember their surnames, put on an interpretive dance to Gone at the <laughs> school assembly. Wow. <laughs> but um, Graves also wrote about psychedelia, particularly his experiences with psilocybin. He only had two, as far as I know. And he, uh, he wrote this fantastic essay, The Poet's Paradise, in 1961. It is very poorly known because it's just buried in his Oxford addresses on poetry. Who is going to pick that up? But it's one of the uh, great pieces of trip lit. And in it, he describes uh, uh, a mushroom experience he had with uh, Robert Gordon Wasson in New York, in Wasson's apartment. It was rather solemn. Uh, Gordon Wasson did a lot of turning luminaries on in his apartment in New York. He uh, had recordings of the Mexican curandera uh, Maria Sabina, and he'd play those back while showing uh, photos of her, and everyone would sit around very solemnly taking mushrooms. But for Graves, this was absolutely uh, a trip to paradise. They both felt that in the figure of Maria Sabina, they'd found the last living priestess of this ancient mushroom religion, purely an invention of their imaginations. Anyway, do check it out. I don't know if it's online, it may well be online. Probably in Erwin, actually. But importantly, what Graves did was that uh, when the white goddess, his, his, sort of, uh, his version of uh, ancient religion, when it was republished in paperback form, crucially in 1961, he wrote a new introduction. And in the introduction, he stated that psilocybin and mushrooms had been used in antiquity, had probably been used by the Celtic bard. And this book was widely, avidly read by hippies, certainly in Britain. And uh, also in the paperback version of the Greek myths, still obviously in print, still widely uh, read, in the introduction he says the same thing. So he's introducing me to literary culture, high-end literary culture, the idea of a magic mushroom tradition in Britain. Now, the white goddess, as scholars have pointed out, is a work of fiction. It's a beautiful work of fiction. He wrote it in 14 days. This poetic frenzy fell upon his shoulders and he wrote this great book. David Allen described Graves as having the British Museum in his head. Out the British Museum came in 14 days. He didn't, Graves was fantastic. He didn't mind whether he made something up or not. He was a magnificent sort of hand waver. Because, oh, well, of course it's true, because blah, blah, blah. I could give you the quote from, I don't know, Pythagoras or something. It didn't matter to him, historical truth because he valued poetic truth more than historical truth, because it was a gift from the goddess, and therefore it was true in a poetic sense. Doesn't really matter for our purposes, because uh, by giving this context for mushroom use in these popular books, The White Goddess and The Green Myths, uh, he gave us an imagined, secret, hidden, underground tra tradition of suicide in mushroom use. And uh, without Graves, well, he helped overturn the um, very entrenched idea that uh, any weird effects coming from mushrooms must mean you've taken something poisonous. Um, this was deeply ingrained in the British psyche. Now mushrooms lead you to paradise, to an ecstatic, otherworldly encounter, perhaps with classical deities. And without Graves, this wouldn't be a common scene every autumn in the upland, grassland areas of Britain. I'm sure there's one or two of you who know that field. And now I do. <laughs> now, my second choice, John Michel, another establishment figure educated at Eton. 
used to lecture down at Prince Charles's um, Sacred Arts uh, thing in London. You know, Prince Charles has got a Sacred Arts Academy where you can study sacred geometry. I only discovered this a month ago. Prince Charles is into sacred geometry. That's kind of weird. John Michel was particularly interested in earth mysteries, archaeoastronomy, UFOs, crop circles eventually, weird stuff, weird law, the weird shit. And he kind of steered underground uh, attention to this um, weird shit, to earth mysteries, and particularly in the influential book, The View Over Atlantis, published in 1969. In fact, it's been said of him that he single-handedly invented earth mysteries. Importantly, he reinvented the ley line. Alfred Watkins uh, invented the ley line, or the ley line, rather, or discovered it. But for Watkins, ley lines were simply prehistoric pathways, very boring. There were footpaths that he thought connected up sacred sites like old burial mounds and stone circles, wells, springs, and hilltops, notches in uh, lines of wells, that kind of thing. He just thought this is how prehistoric people got from A to B. Uh, John Michel completely reinvented this. Whether this was a psychedelic vision or not, I couldn't tell you. But he certainly borrowed ideas from the Chinese geomancy uh, from Feng Shui. Now, after Michel, ley lines and currents of energy moving harmoniously or not through the landscape. It's dragon energy. And here's one of his famous ley lines, the Michael line, actually the Michael Mary line. Uh, which runs all the way from Norfolk down to Cornwall. What he succeeded in doing was re-enchant. Uh, he re-enchanted the British landscape. He said that this ancient network of ley lines was arranged according to sacred principles of sacred geometry. And what he had done was create harmony, harmony between nature and culture between civilization and nature. And we've lost this sacred knowledge. And that's why we live in a disharmonious world. Not only that, this ancient knowledge had been vigorously repressed uh, by the Judeo-Christian mainstream, but it could be rediscovered through uh, measurement and mensuration, going out and uh, uh, looking for ley lines, or indeed through psychedelic revelation. So what Michel did, he drew hippie attention back from the East. People had tended to look to Hinduism, to India, to Buddhism, to Taoism. Michel resacralized the English landscape. He gave us again the idea of Albion. Albion is the magic, the magical side of Britain. And he drew attention particularly to Stonehenge, Avebury, Dustin Vittor, and uh, this beautiful quote, uh, which I nicked from Andy Roberts' fantastic book, uh, and this gives you a measure of the way uh, Michel wrote. Again, he's an Etonian, he writes in this slightly hand waved way, and you're sort of drawn into it, and you realise he said very little at all. But um, it was, I think, in 1966 that I first went to Glastonbury. We had no definite reason for going there. I know the feeling, but it had something to do with strange lights in the sky, new music, and our conviction that the world was about to flip on its axis so that heresy would become orthodoxy and an entirely new world order would shortly be revealed. I'm not sure whether it has. We live in hope. And of course, the two great enduring British festivals, in my opinion, Stonehenge, there it is in the 1970s, when it was a proper festival. I was just too young. I first went there in 88. Anyone there in 88? It was horrible. There was a riot. <laughs> Here it is today. Okay, it exists in a much, much attenuated form, but still, up to 30,000 people go a year. That, to my mind, is still a festival. And of course, the other enduring festival at that time is Glastonbury. The fact that they happened has a lot to do with Michel, who drew attention to both of these places 
as sacred sites, as being spiritually important, as being part of the English sacred landscape. I'm not saying that's why they endure, it's a much more complicated historical reason, but that's part of Michelle's legacy, his re-enchantment of England, Englishness. Now my third choice might seem strangest of all, J.R.R. Tolkien, because Tolkien, although he was a famous pipe smoker, as far as I know, he didn't take any drugs at all, though um, as a professor of Anglo-Saxon, was it, at Merton College, he almost certainly had a taste for the fine wines that exist in the cellars. He was also more than ambivalent about the hippies he used to turn up on his doorstep in South Moor Road um, and sort of worship him. Uh, I don't think he was a great fan of hippie culture. Also a staunch Roman Catholic. However, along with the White Goddess and the view from Atlantis, The Hobbit and The Lord of the Rings were read avidly by hippies and acid enthusiasts. There was the Middle Earth Club in London during the 1960s. There was famously the shop, which gave, gives my talk its name, Gandalf's Garden, one of the first kind of hippie hangout shops where you could go and macrobiotic your way through yoga um, or just hang out with the head cats or whatever the language was in the day. I'm sounding like my grandmother. There's also a magazine, you can get these and you can buy them all digitally now. Buy them, they're just glorious, they're off their time and they're wonderful. Gandalf's Garden, who doesn't want to go and sit in Gandalf's Garden? Uh, Frodo lives, badges, time for a revival of those, surely. <laughs> Now the question is, why did Lord of the Rings, why did Tolkien become avidly taken up into British psychedelia? Well, Patrick Curry uh, has written this fantastic, beautiful little book called Defending Middle Earth, again, thoroughly recommended as a read. And here's what he says about Tolkien's mythology. He says, it embodies the attack on unchecked modernity and presents a world of community, nature, and spiritual values that successfully survive such destruction. Sounds very like hippie ideology. It's not easy, they're not difficult to see why uh, the one slotted into the other. And he goes on. That world, that Tolkien-esque world, seems to be a different one. Middle Earth is a different world with strange people and places. Yet at the same time, it is recognisably ours. Um, my wife and I are currently working our way through. Do you remember the BBC Radio 4 dramatisation of Lord of the Rings? <coughs> Listen, it's fantastic. Everybody's there with Shakespearean accents. And all the elves are sort of speaking like this. Very of its day. And so English, I have forgotten how English Lord of the Rings is. It's another world, but it's recognisably ours. Tolkien puts it like this in a fantastic essay on fairy stories. He says, the primal desire at the heart of fairy, the realisation, independent of the conceived mind, of imagined wonder, the realisation of imagined wonder. That's my emphasis. That to me sounds a lot like tripping, the realisation of imagined wonder. Wonder. So here's my, my three examples. What can we say is distinctive, if anything, about British psychedelia? My hypothesis, my uh, thesis, if you like, is that British psychedelia looks to an imagined past. British psychedelia is deeply concerned with the past. There are exceptions. Hawkwind, for example, but it seems to lack the futurology of American psychedelia. Of course, America has its back to the land movement, it had the whole earth catalogue, and so on and so forth, but it seems to me that American psychedelia is deeply concerned with the future. Tim Leary, in later life, his mantra was smile, which stood for space migration, intelligence increase, life extension. In other words, it's sci-fi. 
We're going to live longer and we're going to leave the planet. Terence McKenna, with his time wave zero and his predictions for 2012, I guess the less said about that, the better. I know, I know he also talked about the arcane world, so he's kind of looking both ways, but he's principally famous for this uh, 2012 thing. Ken Kesey with the magic bus, they urged us to go further, to go forward, onward. And of course, famously, Frederick Jackson Turner wrote uh, in 1893, The Frontier in American History, arguing the importance of this idea of the frontier, the ever-expanding uh, horizon of civilization, the moving frontier, deeply important to the American psyche. Burning Man, the principal American festival, it doesn't happen on, on an American Indian sacred site, I suppose that would be the equivalent of Glastonbury. It happens in wilderness, it happens in the desert. It takes civilization out into the desert. And the unofficial motto, I think, of American psychedelia is to boldly go where no man has gone before. You may have heard that somewhere. By contrast, British psychedelia is all about looking backwards, looking back to a golden age, a lost golden age, a golden age that we can recover through psychedelics. I think it's telling that my examples are all men. They're all establishment figures. I tried hard to find women who've had the same level of influence, and I think it's only within the last 10, 15 years that we are seeing uh, women with that level of influence. They're all establishment figures. Why are we so concerned with the past? Well, there are good historical and cultural reasons. We're still uh, feeling the loss of empire. We still think of us, as David Cameron still thinks of us as Great Britain, where in fact we're mildly shit Britain. <laughs> <laughs> we're still dealing with the Pyrrhic victory of World War II. Yeah, we won, but it kind of shattered us, didn't it? But also, I think there's a very British condition, and that is this British love of nostalgia. Nostalgia. It means literally homesickness, which is odd because we feel very at home in this island. At its worst, this love of nostalgia and our island mentality creates moral panics. The fear that our treasured way of life is being undermined by some drug or some external immigrant or new age traveller. Every single drug that uh, is on topic uh, is being discussed here has caused a moral panic. We've had moral panics about LSD, magic mushrooms, um, um, methadone, um, MDMA, on and on it goes. Um, we've had moral panics about the travels, about festival culture. It's what we did, scum. On the positive side, however, I'm going to invoke Patrick Curry again, he talks about this thing, radical nostalgia. Radical nostalgia. And my example for this is really the 90s road protests, which were, yes, they were ecological, yes, they were political, but they also had a very large strand of psychedelia running through them. Here's a picture of the Dongas up on Twyford Down. And what they were doing, they were appealing to an imagined past, a psychedelic past, a past of tribal living, low impact, with, uh, uh, with its own musical culture. It was feminist, it was enchanted, uh, they wanted to return to an enchanted world. And this is one of my favourite uh, pictures, I show it a lot. That contrast between modern uh, rationalism, which is driving a road through uh, a protected site, site of special scientific interest, and is harking back to a tribal past, the didgeridoo, the horn, the face painting, dreadlocks. It's all uh, semiotically appealing to an ancient past. So, uh, what do I think is distinctive about British psychedelia? I think it's that it exhibits this radical nostalgia. Uh, whether that's looking back to Graves' imagined ancient mushroom cult, uh, Michelle's ancient sacred landscape, Tolkien-esque enchantment, or even if it's whether we're looking back at the golden age of the 60s. I was just born in 68. I missed it, but for me, that period 67 to 73 feels like a golden age. 
British psychedelia looks to the, the past, it reinvents the past to make something new. And that is where I shall finish. Thank you very much for listening.